you'll join me in our sermon reading, which is very short. Genesis 28, 16, we're going to go a little deeper into the story of Jacob, and, and here's what we find out in the midst of, the, of what's happening, and Jacob has fallen asleep. He's seen this dream or this vision of uh, the stairway or the ladder that goes to heaven, and when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Not aware of it. See, we have a new series we're going through, uh, God is Closer Than You Think, um, getting this from John Ortberg's uh, book, and, and it's about drawing close to God in relationship. Now, you know me, and, and most of you know pretty much a lot about me as I've been here for almost five years now. Um, isn't that crazy? I know. And... Uh, I'm always going to be one who's focusing on, what, on being missional, that we as a church are, are in mission with Jesus to, to do um, amazing things. And yet the most important thing we find in Scripture is that we are called into relationship with God through Jesus. That's where it starts and where it is. And if we want to truly be a missional church that, that is powerfully missional, it starts with being relational with God. And this relationship with God is where we draw the strength and, and, and the, whatever's there, the life, to go and share all about this. So as we talk about this sermon series coming up, it's not going to be about religious duties or maybe trying to find a new place where you can uh, uh, serve. And it's not about programs or methods or an institution. It's not about religious activities that can occupy our time and attention. It's about God being a personal being and desiring to be in a personal relationship with us. That's a powerful thought when you think about it. I mean, you can start from Genesis 1, and we know in, in, in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, we found out that, that we are created in what they call the imagio Dei, the image of God. And the image of God is a powerful thought. As God was bringing about creation and other aspects, he said, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good, that's good. But when it comes to humanity, God says it's very good. You see, it's the pinnacle of creation. Humanity, the only thing created in the image of God, capable of rationality and rational thought, capable of love, capable of relationship and interpersonal relationship, especially capable of interpersonal relationship with God, which is an amazing thing. And we even see that God wants to be involved in personal relationship because from the very beginning in the cool of the evening, what does it say is that God walked with them in the garden. Of course, we know the, the story by Genesis 3. There's this thing called sin and, and the fall. And the part of the, really the worst part of the curse of sin is this break, brokenness of this relationship between God and humanity. And really the whole of Scripture then becomes God's initiative and work of redemption and reconciliation and bringing us back into a right relationship with himself. And then we get to Revelation 21, the last book, really, that was written of the Scripture. And John writes this as he sees this great uh, revelation that's taking place and vision. And really, it's at the very end of this book in chapter 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with people, humanity, and he will live with them. And, he will be, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So from the very beginning to the very end, it's all about relationship with God. In fact, John Ortberg put it this way with his quote. He said, the story of the Bible isn't primarily about the desire of people to be with God. It's the desire of God to be with people. And throughout the Bible, there's this consistent theme of God's self-revelation not just so that we might know about God or who God is, but so that we might have a personal relationship with a personal being. And it seems that throughout the Scripture, God constantly calls, constantly reaches out, constantly speaks. Sometimes he might just call a person like Abraham. Sometimes he might speak through a burning bush like he did to Moses. I mean, it's through storms, it's through rainbows, it's through dreams, it's through earthquakes, it's through stillness and silence and quietness. But God is always there trying to build that relationship. This is why I think it's so interesting um, when I look at Michelangelo's painting of God and, and Adam from the Sistine Chapel. And, and as you look at this, I think, it, I think Michelangelo got a point right, and I think he sees this. And the idea is, is if you look at God in the midst of this, 
God is reaching. He's stretching toward. He's turned toward humanity. He's trying to, to close the gap with Adam. Adam's just one small reach from God. But if you look at Adam, how is he? He's kind of reclined and laying back, <laughs> kind of nonchalant, kind of casual, almost like, well, maybe I'll reach for you, maybe I won't. And sometimes I think, isn't that us in our lives? God's right there, whew, reaching for us, and we're like, eh, maybe, maybe not. See, for God, I think it's like, it's like new parents. You ever notice when there's new parents, even grandparents, that uh, you see an awful lot of pictures and videos of the children? Everybody ever noticed that before? Yeah, isn't that true? It's the way it is. Like you see tons of pictures and videos of, of a child who's rolled over from their back to their stomach or those childs that maybe it's their first words that they spoke or their first steps that they took. It's like the parent looks out and says, this is the most incredible thing. No child in the history of the world has ever rolled over from their back to their stomach before and my child did it. And they show you the pictures, right? And it's the video and it's just the most amazing thing. And they think, well, isn't this, nobody's ever done this before, right? No, millions of children do this every day. Okay, so why is it so different? Why is it so impressive that a, that a parent would do that? Because we look at that child through the eyes of a parent, a loving parent. I think it's that way with God as well. See, I think God looks at us with, through the eyes of a loving father, that we've been created to be in relationship with God I know it's not necessarily our, our, our theological background, but the Westminster Catechism, I think they get it right when they say, what is the chief end of humanity? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. We've been created to enjoy God in relationship forever. That's what we're about as humanity. I think sometimes we forget it's about a personal relationship. Even St. Augustine who said, you've formed us for yourselves and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. That God has literally made us for himself. And I truly believe that God is closer than we think. In fact, the very primary promise in the Bible is not I'll forgive you, it's not I'll give you life or anything else. You know what God's primary promise is always? I am with you. That's telling to who God is and who God wants to be. He spoke it to Enoch who was an amazing man that we know very little about. He spoke it to Noah, to Abraham, to Sarah, to Jacob, as we're going to hear today, to Joseph, to Moses, to Joshua, to David, to Mary, to Paul. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And, and it even has this culminating point when Jesus comes and his birth is there. And we remember this because we just had Advent time. And it says, and, and he shall be called Emmanuel. Why? Because it means God is what? with us. And what's Jesus' conclusion to his life? Now, here's Jesus, God with us, and he's for 33-odd years, he's here with us, and he's the one who, who walks with this really interpersonal, intimate relationship with God the entire way through his life. And he comes to the conclusion of his life, and we know there's a cross, there's an empty tomb, and as he's ready for his ascension back to heaven, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, he says, and lo, I am with you always. <laughs> even to the ends of the ages. I'm with you. It's this amazing promise that God has to be with us. This sermon series is going to maybe be a little bit different than some of my others. And part of the reason what I want to have happen here is I want this, even maybe sometimes to be interactive with you, but I want you to think and to ponder and consider things even as we're talking. And I'm going to ask questions, and I want you to begin seeing some of these things and, and to be th begin thinking about these things. Because if God is closer than we think and desires an intimacy of relationship with us, how is it that we can sleepwalk through life without this truth dominating our minds and our lives? That's a question. In fact, as I say this, God is closer than you think and desires a close relationship with you. What runs through your mind? God is closer than you think and desires a relationship with you. What, what runs through your mind when you hear that? What holds you back from seeking 
this relationship with all that you have and all that you are. For me, uh, about going on really 25 years of ministry, okay? And I've seen an awful lot. And I've lived an awful lot in the midst of this as well. Why are there so many times where we have just no great desire to grow in our relationship with God? Why is that? Could it be fear? Does that hold us back? Maybe it's shame. God, the things I've done, there's no way you would possibly want to have a relationship with me. God, the things that have happened to me, I, I just, there's no way we can have this. I mean, you're wrong. You were created to be in relationship with your creator. Maybe we just don't think it can really happen. I know other people, maybe they can have a relationship with you, God, but there's just no way with, with what's here. I, I can't. I just, right? Maybe we're settled. Maybe we're so settled within our lives that we have this fear that says, God, if I grow closer to you, you might want to make changes in here, and I don't know that I want to make them, so let's just keep it at a distance. How's that? Maybe it's complacency. Maybe there's people here who says, I, I truly do not believe that God is a personal being who desires a relationship with me. What holds us back? From the personal presence of God. You know, this is why I shared this verse with you earlier, and I wanted to see this again. This would be a great memory verse that you would know and get to. Jesus says, now this is eternal life. This is life, okay? This, folks, this is what it's all about right here. This is life. That they might know you, the one true God, and know me, Jesus, whom you sent. You know, the word in the original language, gnosko, to know, is not just to know facts about something, but it's about an interpersonal relationship. It's about knowing something in, in a more intimate kind of way. It almost reminds me of Paul's cry in Philippians chapter 3 when he says in the same word there, I want to know Christ. I want to know Jesus, the power of his resurrection, to share in the fellowship of his suffering. I don't care what it is. I don't want to know facts about Jesus. I want to know Jesus. God's great desire to be known in personal experience. You know, A.W. Tozer says this, a loving personality dominates the Bible. This personality who's present, speaking, pleading, loving, working, manifesting himself wherever and whenever his people have the receptivity necessary to receive. And today we're going to look at one of these relational times where God interacts with Jacob. See, here's the story of Jacob. Jacob was an interesting character in the Bible. Uh, if you remember kind of how it flows, God makes this great promise to Abraham. We've all heard of Abraham, right? Abraham has a child, Isaac. Isaac has children, Jacob and Esau, which we'll get to in a minute. But Jacob is just an interesting character. In fact, I had a seminary professor who I think put it really, really well. He said Jacob, is ju he was just a stinker, and he really was. He was a stinker. He was a person who, when they talked about God, he talked about your God, not our God. <laughs> he lied, he cheated, he deceived. And one day, while he was running from his brother Esau, who wanted to kill him because he had cheated him out of his inheritance, of course, we know Esau was not the sharpest knife in the drawer by letting him do that anyway in the first place. And not only has he wanted to get him for cheating him out of his inheritance, but then he went and deceived his father Isaac and... and, and He's on the run. And Jacob one day stops in the evening, and the scripture says, in a certain place. In other words, what that means is nowhere in particular. Everybody have ever been nowhere in particular before? <laughs> uh -huh. Nowhere in particular, just an ordinary place in the middle of nowhere. And he took a stone that was probably as hard as his head was at that time of his life. And he lays down and he goes to sleep. And he's done nothing to merit this, but yet God comes to him and shows him and reveals things to him with this vision. And we know the story is this, the, la the ladder, the stairway that, that goes literally from heaven down and touches the earth and angels are going up and down upon it. And there's God. 
And God calls out to him and speaks and says, hey, I'm the Lord. <laughs> the God of your father, remember Grandpa Abraham, your dad Isaac? I'm going to give you this land. I already swore that I was going to do this. And then he makes this interesting statement. He says, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. He didn't even realize God was with him. I'm with you. And he wakes. And what he says is the most amazing thing. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Surely the Lord was in this place, and I was completely unaware of God's presence right here with me. But this is the house of God. He calls it the gate of heaven. He calls it really this place now that's been transformed to the place where God is present. You see, his eyes were opened. God's here in this ordinary place with an ordinary person, but I think the key word to all of this is being unaware. I didn't know it. See, what this tells us is this. It would seem that God can be present closer than we think or know, and yet we can be totally unaware of his presence. That's scary. <laughs> it's reality. This certain place, this ordinary place is transformed into the place inhabited by God, where God is present. What I want us to see and understand today, this can be your life. This could truly be your reality of being aware of God's presence moment by moment. God is closer than we think. I truly believe moment by moment in our life, but we have to be aware of it and live it out moment by moment. See, Jacob starts this new awareness and this new journey of awareness, this lifelong journey of, of probably a handful of steps forward, maybe a couple steps backwards, of learning to grow and be aware of God's presence within his life. So here's my question. This is a big one for you. Everybody ready? Another interactive time. How do we make ourselves more aware? How do we be, say a prayer like this? Let us become more aware of your presence to experience the glory of your goodness right here with us. Maybe it's, and this is why I showed you Psalm 139. Maybe you should read that. Uh, maybe, maybe take a week or two and read that psalm, especially the first 10 verses that we read right there, every single day until it's so ingrained in your head that you hear it, you see it, you know it without even thinking about it. The idea of, of when it, the psalmist simply says, where can I go to flee from your presence, God? I go up to the highest of the heavens, you're right there. I go down into the Sheol, into the grave, into the depths of the earth, you're right there. I go, I go to the other side of the sea, and you're right there. I can't get away from you. And yet, how do we sleepwalk through life where we don't even know God's with us? And let's be honest, I'll ask you another question here. Are you ready? Think back to last week. How often were you aware of God's presence right there with you as you lived your life. If we'd have been more aware, would it maybe have changed an attitude you had at a certain time? A word that you spoke? <laughs> a thing that you did? Oh, wow. Aware and unaware. <laughs> See, for Jacob... He has this new awareness, and, and, and he's awoken. And really, he's been awoken with this blessing where God just kind of says, hey, I'm here, <laughs> I'm with you. It doesn't always happen that way, does it? How many of you have had dreams where there's a ladder and God spoke to you? I, I didn't figure. God, God likes to do things once and then move on to something else. How many of you have been spoken to through a burning bush? He did it once with Moses. Said, eh, that's enough, I'll try something else now. See, God loves to show us different ways in, in interacting with us. <laughs> to be close. But I think we can still also have these blessing times where we learn to grow in God's presence and recognize and be aware of his presence. You know, maybe it's a birth of a child, a grandchild. Maybe it's an unexplained healing. 
Maybe it's a restored relationship. We thought there's no possible way this could ever happen, and all of a sudden God does this miracle, and you're like, wow. And you begin to realize, hmm, I'm feeling the presence of the Lord in the midst of this. Maybe we're awoken by other things, like by suffering, by pain, by loss. Maybe it's that report that comes back from the doctor, and all of a sudden, wow, life has changed, and we begin to recognize God's presence in a new way in different way. But I truly believe this. Each moment that we live outside of the awareness of God's presence, we are sleepwalking through life. We're missing the greatest moment this life has to offer, the present moment of being with God and enjoying life with God. And my prayer is that each and every one of us this morning are going to have one of these awakening moments and begin this amazing journey into God's presence. And recognizing that God is closer than we think every moment of our lives. Living with a new awareness of God. No longer saying, oh, I was unaware. God was right there with me. I didn't even know. It might happen at the cubicle that you work at. The desk where you're sitting. It might be in front of the computer. It might be at school, it might be at work, it might be when you're in the car, it might be when you're riding on the bus, it might be when you're out in the yard, it might be when you're in the garden. Oh, we look forward to those days in a few months, don't we? Ah. Maybe it's when you're in your house. Maybe it's when you're lying in your bed. Maybe it's when you're on vacation. This journey. The Chinese sage, Lao Tzu, says the journey of a thousand miles begins with a first step. So true. The journey of the soul, where we begin to walk fully aware of God's presence, not only in those extraordinary times, but in our ordinary times. So my prayer is that we, as a church, but as individuals, will begin a deeper spiritual growth as we increase our capacity to experience the presence of God in our daily lives. Practicing the presence of God. And it's not just being aware we're going to see in this series, but it's, it's about surrendering to God. It's about our dependence upon God. It's about se- accepting God's power and life to be flowing in us and through us because this is how Jesus lived as our example, walking moment by moment in the presence of God. And so for the next two weeks... I'm so hoping that we're going to learn to pray, Lord, you are present here. Help us be aware of your presence. I gave you all a homework assignment. Do you see it inside the bulletin? Anybody? It's a little sheet of paper in there. What it says at the bottom is to review these truths once a day for two weeks as you cultivate the practice of God's presence. There's some powerful things here. And I said this in the first service. I hated it when someone handed you a piece of paper and then read it to you. I was like, yeah, in kindergarten I learned to read. You don't have to read this to me, right? But today I'm going to go over a few of these with you because I want you to hear it, see it, and read it together. God's always present in your life, whether you recognize it or not. Recognizing and experiencing God's presence, I believe, is learned behavior, and we can learn. Our task is to meet God in the moment. We're tempted to live outside that moment, but we'll lose God's presence in the midst of it. It's a big one here. Sometimes God, doesn't, uh, sometimes God seems far away for reasons I do not understand, but it's an opportunity to learn, and sometimes it'll be that way. When I fail, I can immediately start this whole process again. I love the one. No one knows the full extent to which human beings can experience God's presence. My desire for God ebbs and flows. Anybody else's desire ebb and flow for God? God's is constant. We'll talk about the thought of the, uh, that carries a spiritual charge to move us closer or away. We'll talk about the aspects of our lives, every bit of it, of immense interest to God. 
And a very important one. My path to experiencing God's presence is not to look like it's not going to look like anyone else's. You're created as an individual. And it's not going to look like somebody else's, and that's okay. And the last one probably is the big one that I want to get to as we move into this week. Straining and trying too hard, they do not help. See, we're talking about walking hand in hand in a relationship of love. We're not talking about trying to force it and, and put pressure on it. And that doesn't seem to ever work for relationships, does it? It's just walking hand in hand in love, and you begin to grow. That's what we're talking about with God. So would you look through these, maybe even begin to, to pick one out that you're going to say, this week is one I'm going to really focus on right here and begin to look at. And as you take a moment to do so, uh, the band's going to come up. We've got the final song we're going to sing. As we remember, God is closer than you think.